Okay. Okay, well, welcome to those that have come and we'll give a few more minutes to let more people join us. Well, it looks like we might have lost Karen for a second, but I just wanted to welcome those who are just joining us. Uh, I think we're just waiting another minute to let people join us and then we'll get started. There she is. In here. <laughs> What do you think, Karen? Should we get started here soon? Yeah, we have what, 14. Yeah, I think I think we've we've got a few minutes in here. Hopefully we've got people who are joining us and we'll we'll keep letting people in if they join us at this point. So you're in charge, right? No, you're in charge. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> She's watching. Is 
I want to welcome everybody tonight and we're excited to learn about this topic about positive interactions with law enforcement. We have um, Colleen from the Utah Parent Center that will be presenting and someone from the Sheriff's Office and I didn't catch the name. I think it was Jamie. So we just welcome everybody. And so when Colleen is ready or we can go ahead and, and start with our presentation. Perfect, thanks you guys. Um, yeah, so I am, let's so get right into this. I am Colleen Kenny. And so, um, and yeah, I do, I wanna introduce Jamie Cox. She is with um, the Davis County Sheriff's Department. I really, really appreciate her time to be here with us. And um, I think that because it is, you know, a family to family network event, um, please feel free to, you know, if you have any questions, put them in the comment. We can be a little more casual. Um, I don't have a super strict script or anything for this. And so I might be a little bit over, all over the place too. Um, but this is a really important topic to me. Um, it's something that I've seen a lot of my good friends and family members go through. And um, as well, I have a lot of really great friends and family members in law enforcement. And we I work with families that have um, kids with disabilities every single day that are part of law enforcement. So I know how important this topic is. Um, so I'm excited that everybody else is, is interested and, um, and, and, and wants to get a little bit more information. So again, I do work at the Utah Parent Center. I'm part of the Utah Family Voices Project where I am a parent consultant and we offer um, health and medical resources for families that have kids with, with varying disabilities. Um, Right, and that does include mental mental health illnesses and stuff. Um, and then for about 20 years, I've been part of the Autism Council of Utah. Um, this is my family, we live in Sandy and that cute young lady in the middle is my daughter, Maya. Um, and so she's kind of what introduced me to Utah Parent Center and to um, just parent advocacy in general and stuff which um, actually is where a lot of this got started. So um, last year, as you, as many of you might, may or may not know, I don't know, um, a new law went into place. It's actually is a law for Utah now. Um, and it started with grassroots stuff. It happened because of parents got involved. Um, a group of parents went to their local legislators and they said, um, you know, we're, this is a concern of ours. Um, a lot of our kids are getting older and bigger. Um, we were having issues in the community and we were concerned about um, things that could or couldn't happen. We wanted to educate our, we wanted to be part of our community and we wanted to educate everybody, including law enforcement about our kids. Um, so we went to our local representatives and they had tons of support for it. They were like, yeah, that's a great idea. Why don't we do something like that? And they actually did, they, they, they opened up a bill to find out that in the Senate, they were also running some bills on the exact same thing. And this was in like 2018, 2019. Um, and actually Senator, so it was Senator, Senator Eliason out of Cottonwood Heights and Senator Thatcher had something going on for CIT and post training. Um, and they were just really great to get behind it all the way. And they actually put some parents on this council um, that helps decide on policies and on different kinds of procedures as well as training things that go on in our state. Um, and an interesting thing that I learned about law enforcement in our state is it isn't just one size fits all. Everybody isn't doing the same thing. So what my city in Sandy is doing is very, very different than what is going on in another city or county in other places in the state. And that's not just like, oh, you might have, um, you know, Sandy City Police compared to, you know, um, the Sheriff's Department or something. It's literally administrative, like whether they report to a mayor or whether they report to administrator, whether they report directly to um, a state level official, it varies literally 
state by state. However, there are certain training standards that everybody has to follow. And so that's where we really wanted to, to hit. We wanted to make sure that it was somehow um, generalized. Somehow it was going to be consistent across the board for, for, all, for all law enforcement. Um, and again, it was surprising that when I went to my representative and said, this is what we're going to do. So be looking for this. This is what I'm gonna be up at the Capitol for this year. And um, her first response was, and, and by this time we actually were into um, some of the messy stuff going on. Um, there was the, the high profile shooting in Salt Lake that had happened. Um, and some other, you know, newsworthy events were happening. But to me, it was still like, I still have this love for law enforcement. I still, you know, think it's a great idea. I still want my kids to meet our local law enforcement. And I want to have this good relationship. And I want to learn how to do these things. Um, but my representative said, ooh, but is law enforcement on, on, on board with this? And that was the first time I went, e. I don't know, it's such a great idea. Why wouldn't anybody be on board with this? Only to find out that they really are. They really are. Um, so we had so much support, in fact, that um, we got not just promises, but there were people all the way from the director of post and the director of, again, this training council and everything that said, you know what, even if this bill doesn't pass, and by then it had been put in as House Bill 334, um, we're going to implement it anyway. We're going to require that all of our post candidates go through um, autism specific training and training on developmental disabilities and some extra mental health um, training and CIT training. And so he was just 100% on board with that. Um, we were able to, to work with some parents and some great advocates that were with us um, to kind of like volunteer to write the bill and to um, create some curriculum kind of um, around these trainings. And so we actually were able to start it with no fiscal note at all, which always helps in Utah. Um, so even though it is technically a mandate, it went through as a mandate that um, we had like no opposition, which is just awesome. Just saying, just given like Utah some credit and, and everything like that. So that is where this all started. So now every single post candidate, as well as any officer to reinstate every year needs yearly training, um, again, specifically on autism, mental health and, and developmental disabilities. Believe it or not, that wasn't a requirement in any kind of training prior to that. And again, that started with just grassroots stuff, just us going to our legislators and saying, isn't this a great idea? Yeah, I think it is. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about what those trainings look like. Um, so at the attorney general's office, I, I do some volunteering with them. And so I know their trainings pretty well. So they have um, this five-sided virtual reality room. And it's pretty cool. And that's where like a lot of, um, officers go for like taser training, shooter training, things like that. It's a very um, standard training setting for them. And so um, they were, they're able to go in and they've added this new module or whatever. And it was actually written by like the Southwest um, Center for Research, Autism Research and something like that. Um, and it has like hundreds of these, well, it's got these, these like VR scenarios, but each scenario has hundreds of outcomes depending on um, each officer's interaction. So they learn a little bit about autism and it's interesting. Um, not everybody has, has had, had interaction with anyone with autism or has somebody in their family. Like oh, I really thought by like 2021, like there can't be a person in this room. Um, that, you know, when you ask, you know, are you, you know, have you, have you, do you know somebody with autism or, you know, how many degrees of separation from somebody with autism or a developmental disability, you know, um, 
and we still get groups of five or six people that that don't and so that's so that's the kind of that's the level that we're starting at pretty basic levels you know what i mean like what is autism basically you know um but then they get a chance to to actually have these live interactions in these vr scenarios and they're done beautifully by real autistic actors um and and they're developed for when law enforcement encounters people on the spectrum and it helps them to learn to distinguish those certain behaviors from those that um are typically what they're typically trained to understand like mimic indicators for like drug and alcohol use or deceptive behavior um but these scenarios kind of all really represent different levels of the autism spectrum and as a volunteer you know they usually try to have a parent or a family member or a caregiver or an individual with autism there to also give a perspective um of each of these scenarios and and why a person might act this way what they could do better what they really you know i love telling them you know, like what they did great you know <laughs> positive reinforcement don't we all love that um but again like the one on the left is just a woman trying to make a police report, but she's super stuck on a stim. Um, and it's just trying to teach an officer that that patience, like that, that how uncomfortable that five second processing might be and what you could expect from that, you know? Um, another, the one in the middle is one that I'm I, I I really, really get worried about for families and friends and stuff like this. And personally is um, it's a kid at a park that's acting strange outside of a bathroom and he has. You know, items with him that he's acting strange with outside of the bathroom at the park, you know what I mean? But it's just a kid, you know, that has a toy. He's waiting for his mom in the bathroom. But the cool one about this is like, again, it's this five sided room and it kind of mimics like the, the, the car pulling up and there's lights and sirens and everything. And they really have to, to react to his reaction to the sensory input of it. And so it's cool to see the officers that recognize his behaviors and are like, you know, hey, should we turn off the lights and the sirens for you? And there is a response from him that um, you can kind of see the computer there and the picture on the right that, you know, there's somebody manipulating it. And he's like, yes, please, you know, they scare me or something. And it's, it's just a cool experience. Um, one of the last scenarios is a kid in a, in a convenience store. His dad is next door. Um, and the store clerk calls in for shoplifting, but the kid doesn't have, you know, I don't know. It's just like these very typical scenarios to me. I feel like they're very real life scenarios. Um, and I talk a lot about how in this situation, even my daughter, who I would like to say we never leave alone. We just cannot leave alone for more than a minute or two, you know, um, she's functionally not, not, not super communicative. Um, but we're trying to teach her independence and how important it is to let her go and try and find her own, even just her own Mountain Dew and Skittles at the store. You know what I mean? Like we're trying to teach these independence skills to our kids. And this is a perfectly wonderful thing that this dad did is to drop his kid off at the, the convenience store. Um, and the fact that he may or may not have been hundred percent successful um, shouldn't end in a negative law enforcement situation, you know what I mean? And so it teaches these officers how to um, recognize these things and to interact with these things um, really positively. And it's been, it's so cool to see how, um, how much they do learn from these situations. After that, we also do get a chance to um, do a lot of class, classroom training. And then in that classroom training, um we actually do show some pretty um graphic body cam stuff um from all the way you know like there's there's negative experiences and then we also do 
try to end with some positive experiences and stuff. And even the, the, the hard ones to watch, there's a few that, um, it, I've seen a hundred times, like literally over the course of how many trainings I've done that still get me very emotional or I start to get sweaty. <laughs> I'm like all sweaty and shaky watching it, even though I know, you know, I know the outcome. I know how old this video is. It still gives me a lot of anxiety, but it's not to like criticize the officer or like go, Oh my gosh, he did this and this and this wrong. Isn't he horrible? Isn't this a horrible officer? It's a really great chance to point out little things to them that like, okay, um, what things could have tipped you or would have tipped you off that this isn't suspicious behavior. This is, you know, something different or something um, that should be recognized as either autism or a developmental delay or, you know, a mental illness that or a mental health issue that doesn't need law enforcement. And so those are the good experiences that come out of it, even though, again, they're pretty hard, you know, footage to watch. Um, and again, there's the AG's office is doing these trainings. The ACU uh, does these for free. And um, there's, there's a few private advocates that do trainings across the state. UVU does a training through an organization called ALEC. Um, and there, I know that there's somebody up at USU that does them um, as well. Um, let's see. The other thing that we've learned though, is that there are some things that we could train families on as well. Um, and some of those things are, it, it, it's, you know, common sense things, you know what I mean? Like create these positive interactions. Those are getting, you know, a little bit hard right now with COVID. So be careful and call ahead, but um, you could take your child to meet your local law enforcement agencies or, you know, take a tour of a first responder department or something. Um, however, just remember, like, you're not going to be able to train a whole department on your kid personally, you know what I mean? It's more about teaching your kid about, or you know, your, your family member about what the uniform looks like, what the equipment looks like. It's making them comfortable with the situation. It's not meant to try and help an officer diagnose autism. It's not to help them be an expert on it. Um, or even an expert on your kid, your the chances of you getting that specific officer or first responder are pretty low. Sorry, you know, in most in most cases, but it's 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 more about you know teaching your family member about the agency and about the um, the the position in the community than it is about teaching the law enforcement agency about your child. So just kind of go into it with with that a little bit. Um, and again, just to always have positive attitudes, but you know, you want to, you want to talk about law enforcement appropriately and what their, what you would like their role to be for your family. And, and again, um, if you're speeding and you get pulled over, like, you know, that's, you know, we know what's going to happen and then always act appropriately for that situation, you know, follow those laws, do those things, and even explain to your kid why you're doing those things. And so that they are prepared and they know ahead of time, what's going to happen. Um, that's something else that we talk a lot to officers about though, is traffic stops. And I can talk a little bit about that more too, is, um, wandering and traffic stops are actually what a lot of families are scared of just day to day, let alone like the big major stuff when our kids get older or bigger. Um, and also to create these proactive plans. What do you want when you call for help from a first responder? Um, is it for a wandering child? Then you want to know, then you're going to want to have something prepared. Um, know where your closest bodies of water are, where the closest train tracks are, where your child's favorite places to go, even where the routes that you frequently take are, make sure that those things are ready to give 
to, to a responding officer. Um, I didn't think that my daughter could follow directions. I mean, she couldn't tell you where my house is. She can't tell you where her school is, but I, I know for a fact that if I take a different route, she will melt the freak down, which to me tells me she does know where we're going when we're going someplace. You know what I mean? So again, if that's somewhere that we frequent every single day, that's something I need to tell an officer that might be someplace that she's trying to get to, you know, those kinds of things. Like you don't know what they, what's going on in their head. So you want to have those things ready to go. Um, and then again, if it is in a crisis situation, what do you, what do you want a responding officer? What do you want their, you know, what do you want their position to be? Is it to be transport? Is it to be um, submission? Is it to be de-escalation? You need to, you need to have that in your head before you even need to call, let alone that you make that call. Um, and, and, and be able to, um, to describe that to dispatch, let alone to the officer that remains. And then please, Jamie, Jamie, please just jump in. Don't even just jump right in. Um, I think you're doing great. Okay, good. Yes. Information you can give to dispatch when you call, um, will be the most helpful for us. So things that would be triggers or things to avoid, um, in our response would be helpful. Um, just knowing that information ahead of time helps us, as you all know better than I, um, a, a whole bunch when we get there, if we don't have to de-escalate something that we may have caused unknowingly by the way we respond, or maybe we don't have 10 people come, maybe we only have one person come so that we're not overwhelming an individual is helpful. Um, just the, the most information you can give to us when you're calling, if you do need help is can be relayed to us and make sure that dispatch understands that they need to give us that information. There's also a lot of tools that you can use. Um, again, you know, ahead of time, um, there's social stories. There's lots of really great ones online. Um, don't pay for any of them unless there's like specific artwork that you really love from an Etsy shop or something, but we can help facilitate, you know, some social stories if you need that at the parent center, I'm sure, you know, um, there's also an app called Florio that we had a connection with for a while that does um, VR trainings and let the, for your home. Like, so if you have those little, like you can get them for like five bucks, little boxes that you put your cell phones in, you know? Um, and then a parent also has to have like a cell phone or a, or a tablet, a device as well separately. Um, but it takes them through these scenarios and it has them like practice, um, different situations and Role different playing. interactions. Yeah, is huge. If you can um, prepare anyone that may have contact with law enforcement, whether uh, understanding sometimes it's not the parent that calls or the family member, right? It's the store clerk at the 7-Eleven that thinks there's shoplifting going on, right? So having those discussions with your child about if a law enforcement officer practice those questions, they're going to ask you your name and your date of birth. And if they're nonverbal or they don't communicate that way, maybe a tag on their shoe that states whatever pertinent information that we, we could look at to see, oh, because sometimes we don't know that that's the case. There's, you know, we're, we're all getting training. And, and I feel like for the majority of us as law enforcement officers are pretty aware, especially if we've been doing it for a minute, just in life, right? You're, you're aware of signs and, and things to look for, but just in case, like there's something on their shoe or a backpack, they've got a tag, or maybe they're nonverbal or they don't want to be verbal, but they can hand me a student ID card that on the back you have written, I, I'm autistic, call my mom, or anything that you think would be helpful, role-playing those with your child and just saying this could happen, or when you come to the police station to have us be able to say, <clears throat> we're going to ask your name and date of birth and, and if you know where you live or who we can call to help you would just be very beneficial because we are most of the time, I think getting phone calls, it's not from a family member. Um, you guys are all well more equipped than I am to handle your day-to-day -day life. It's just when things have gone wrong or something's, you know, not appearing normal to whomever calls. I don't know how to better articulate that. But. And that's actually another one that we, that I talk about in the trainings that I do is that, um, no, I'm sorry, no matter what is never appropriate to walk up to somebody and say, so, uh, do you got autism or like, what's, you know, is there something wrong with you? 
However, it is appropriate to say, is there someone I can call for you? Is there, you know what I mean? Because again, most of our kids, we will not be far or our, you know, there will be some kind of caretaker, caregiver, somebody that supports an individual that they know how to get a hold of. Because again, even individuals that drive or are, you know, independent to a degree, um, can still have selective mutism in, in anxious situations, things like that. So again, you're just preparing for everything. And I'm going to talk a minute about the crisis, the, the actual crisis situations. So there, there will be um, times when it's when we're calling or we, we feel like a last resort might be to call because of a crisis. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, crisis planning. And really, the there's a really great module. There's a really great I, I, um, thing right on our website. So I'm not going to like reinvent the wheel or redo the whole training. But on the Parent Center website, um, and, and I can send a bunch of links to everybody if anyone wants them. Um, under our resources, there is a section for dual diagnosis um, stuff, which means anyone with any kind of like developmental disability plus um, a mental health issue. And so I think at this day and age, that kind of applies to most of us. I don't know, I don't kind of, but um, it's the dual diagnosis modules. And then kind of towards the bottom is the, there, well, there's a section for treatments and interventions, and it goes through all these really, really great supports, all these really great resources. Um, and again, no amount of planning or preparation is going to cure any kind of mental illness. It's not going to prevent any behaviors, but it opens the door to our coping mechanisms. And I think that the better prepared we are to cope with these situations, the less likely we are to need um, the kind of, you know, support we're talking about through law enforcement. And, uh, you know, it does start with just general wellness and possibly some, you know, your medical needs. And so, if we can work with our physicians and be aware of our kids' baselines and what their baseline behaviors are, we might be able to eliminate um, medical reasons for certain behaviors. But also like, can't, like I know when we're getting to really, when we get to crisis points, we've been to crisis points a few times. We've gone all the way to, you know, we've had uni visits. We've had to have transportation help before. So, I mean, we've been there. Um, but I always felt so bad because looking back, there was always a symptom. There was always something that I should have caught. You know what I mean? There was that four nights in a row she didn't sleep or, you know, she had, you know, we'd had constipation problems for too long, or I knew that there was, you know, um, diet issues going on. But again, not all of that can be fixed with just diet and exercise. Sometimes medications need to be you know, need to be used. And maybe that's why you need um, higher levels of help or something. But if we can think about the triggers and the situations from even just the last time we were on the edge of a crisis, um, what were those triggers? What, what, what was it that led up to that? Um, those are the kind of things that we want to work on to maintain um, good mental health as much as we can. Um, also, what can we do, you know, what in those circumstances helped maybe not to prevent it, but to de-escalate it, know those things ahead of time. Um, have you utilized all your resources, including um, calling us for just, you know, support or for, for anything that you might need? Um, it might include taking extra classes, maybe getting trained in certain behavior supports, we are running out of resources for our kids in our state, for sure. They are few and far between right now. It is really, really difficult. Um, but one thing I can access is I can access my own therapist. And I can learn how to, you know, cope, 
I, you know, I can reach out for my own coping support and therapy. And, and that's, that's also really huge. Um, so just kind of also knowing ahead of time where your child can be treated and stabilized, not every hospital will be able to take developmental disabilities and a significant medical issue and autism or, you know, a combination of those things, especially depending on age of the individual, you will want to know ahead of time what facilities can handle what situations, you know, we have to help families find specialty care a lot. And, and again, it's few and far between. And so you want to know what facilities um, can treat and stabilize your child if you ever need that. Um, another one is part of the plan is what kind of support would you want if you felt that way? Um, one of our family family members, um, Julia, talked about in one of her workshops, she keeps a, she said she does it like to this day. She keeps like a three by five card in her purse about the person that she cares for. And it, it helps um, kind of as a maintenance thing, but also in crisis because you're all over the place. And so she can pull it out and it does have not just, you know, emergency phone numbers and medications. It has a list of things that they love and things that you, that she loves about that individual, um, their favorite movies. It reminds her to, you know, um, pull out something, you know, special for them, what they need to to stay calm or in recovery, those things that you, you don't think of in the moment, um, things that you can work on even just afterwards too, as well, to, to maintain that, you know, that recovery from the crisis. Um, so what supports would have helped an individual to avoid it? You know, again, if it's not the first time, it won't be the last time and kind of use those past experiences to, to create that action plan. Besides calling um, your local law enforcement, and I have a list of those available too for all of Davis County that I can send out um, for the non-emergency numbers. There are a couple um, resources in Davis County for crisis support through Davis Behavioral Health. Um, and, and, it, and they kind of go by age. So if you have an individual that's like, you know, infant through age 21, they can utilize a stabilization and mobile response team. Um, if they're over 18, they, you can utilize a, a mobile crisis outreach team. And then again, anyone that has, um, suicidal ideation or is talking about hurting themselves or is threatening self-harm, that's the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. And you should always kind of keep those numbers um, available if you are, you know, a family that needs crisis help, you know, make sure you have that. Um, Jamie posted her phone number. I can put that when I do the slides, I'll redo the slides and I can put links and, and stuff like that in there as well. So that's my um, office phone. If they want to arrange something with the sheriff's office or I have, you know, work with the other local law enforcement agencies in Davis County, as well as the fire departments, I could at least get you in the right, point you in the right direction. Um, if you need something, we'll give you the non-emergent line. Everyone should know 911, but we'll give you the dispatch number two if you want to call and you feel like you need to add. That's another thing is we can flag your address with dispatch if you feel like that would be helpful. Um, just so if we're responding to your home, it'll come up with an alert and you can give us specifics that you would like us to know before arriving at your home um, so that we can be a little bit more prepared to not make things worse or um, things that would trigger or things that would help or whatever you guys think would be helpful information. It's good to have that on file if you feel comfortable with that. That's super generous. Thank you. I was wondering that too. I didn't know if you guys had a... Um kind of a special needs registry or anything like that. Um, Cause again, we those are special, not... like for all sorts of things. So people with um, health concerns that we, we respond on for me medical stuff. If you know, you've got a LVAD or something we know about, like we can flag that in there. So when we're responding, we kind of know what things we need to take in. Or if 
you know, we've had issues at a home before we can usually put the reason why so that it's not just a someone's acting erratic, it can be we understand the reasoning and, and can send even the more appropriate, maybe we have officers that are CIT trained or something we can send more appropriate resources if they're available and, and help mitigate help mitigate things that way. Awesome. That's really cool. Thank you so much. So that third one down, that is a list of um, all of the count Davis County um, fire agencies and police agencies and all of their non um, emergency numbers. But again, I, you know, I can, I can send out links if you want. Um, and then I, I found a couple extra things and they're actually ones that from when I was doing an emergency preparedness thing is um, there. And, and again, I, I didn't find, I know Weber does it and Box Elder, Salt Lake County does that. I don't know if Davis County, if you guys get trained on yellow dot, do you guys get tra trained on yellow dot? Um, we've had it, had it. Um, it's something we're aware of, but I wouldn't say we do a regular training on it. So I think right. most of us are aware just from working in the field and, yeah, you know, we do safety fairs where their teams are providing that information. Yeah, it's actually through the highway patrol, but it's, it's, a, and you can just go online and it's, um, thing where you put like a yellow dot on your car, but, and then you put like a little baggie of information in your glove box, um, and then like, let's say if you got in an accident and you couldn't talk or you were incapacitated somehow, you could have information on yourself and your child or something, you know what I mean? In that, in case of an emergency as well. Um, and it's through, it's actually through Vial of Life, which is the one that you'd put in your house, which is technically for seniors, and but- put it in the fridge or freezer for those, but a lot of families do it for just, you know, if they have caregivers at the home or respite care or something, then yep. got the information that maybe the person that's caring for the individual doesn't have right offhand. So it's very helpful if there's a seizure. I mean, we get called for all types of, you know, issues at home. So it's just helpful to know medications and allergies and all that kind of stuff for every aspect. It's good for everybody. I should probably do one for my family. <laughs> I know. Right. And it's funny because they say to put it in your fridge or your freezer, because again, like not everybody has you know, a cabinet to the left of their microwave, or you know what I mean? Like not everybody has the same setup in their home, but right now, like everybody has a fridge in their home. Everybody does, you know what I mean? So like, that's where it, why like Vial of Life, and, and you can look that up too, vialoflife.com um, has you put it like on your fridge or something. So yeah. Um, and this actually, JB was talking about a card that you could hand out. Um, and this is something that they use similar to this is through even just at scenic view for again the individuals that drive and and are out in the community um it's a little card that the melissa nellison center developed you know what i mean that has some information about autism in general but also a place to put some emergency information um, and some personal information that you can just hand you know to an officer um and um, that's another one that that could be helpful as well. Um, one that our family has used before in the past too is it's the National Autism Association's Big Red Safety Box. And they used to send them out for free. Like you could pay like $3 shipping and handling and they'd send you this huge kit of amazing stuff. And they still do sometimes, I think. But you can actually download most of the information and like all of these cards and all of the stop signs, which um, seem silly, but they have helped my kid a ton. Like they, they start learning those community signs so young and they're kind of like blasted in their head so much that man, we put those all over the place, the window, the fridge, the door locks, the, you know what I mean? Like, and it does, you know, it doesn't always stop her from leaving, but I mean, it does remind her, it does slow her down. Um, it comes with the window and the window alarms and the door alarms. Um, but again, you can get those at Home Depot. Like you can get certain models of those for like six or seven bucks. And again, it doesn't prevent wandering, but that's my favorite thing about my Vivint system or, you know, my security system. We have alarms on every single cupboard and every drawer in our house. And again, it doesn't keep her out of them, but it lets me know like, oh, she's in the cupboard. Oh, she's in the fridge. And it just lets me, you know, be aware and I can go and supervise that. 
and event, like my daughter's 23 now and so yeah eventually she stopped getting into him she's like I don't I don't need mom looking over my shoulder all the time like it's not nothing in there is that important you know so <laughs> but um those things have helped a ton and then it does come with like a coupon for one road id um bracelet which is again a medical alert style bracelet those and all really this good. great information i have those um, for my kids and they can be put on your shoelace too so if you've got somebody that doesn't maybe like to wear bracelets or have stuff on their person everybody wears shoes right so or maybe i have been talking about this and didn't anybody, talk but about yeah it clicks on your shoe and and then we've got something there that's those are great i i do have my kids have those road ids now just because i'm paranoid and there's the actual pictures of what I've been talking about. Sorry, move the slides <laughs> would help a ton. So yeah, there's there's a picture of like the what um, comes in like the big red safety box. But again, all of the paper materials you can download for free. Um, and then including the, the book, there's one for caregivers, for teachers and for first responders. And um, so, and like I said, the, the door and window alarms, we've, I have found them at Home Depot for a few bucks before. Um, and then just some, some little cards and stuff. They're pretty cool. Um, then ones that we've used again in our personal house is don't mind my dirty car. Cause that was on my, that is on my car. Um, I got these on Etsy. Um, somebody was selling them online and I don't know. They kind of, they, it does help me feel better knowing that if I am to get pulled over or if something happens to me while we're in the car and they tried to, um, interact with my daughter, they, now they know why she's behaving the way she is. It's not, you know, it's not abnormal for her baseline really. Same with the home. Um, they no longer suggest that you put like those top finder stickers in your children's windows. Um, if you, if you're worried about that, you're supposed to put them on the inside of your doors now, like, so on, you know, interior doors, but this is on, this one is on my front door. So it doesn't, you know, like call out her window or her room. Um, but just that, again, if something ever happened where someone came into my home, like law enforcement needed to come into my home, they would know that she's not being uncompliant, um, that, that, that it, these are the reasons she's, she's having those behaviors. And this was her old medical alert bracelet. I should have taken a picture of the clasp. The clasp is the most amazing thing on her bracelet before it broke, of course. Um, this was from when she was a little she still wears one. Um, and so it has her name, it has my phone number and it just says autism, autistic may not speak. Maya is semi-verbal, but again, you would not understand her. If you asked her a question, she is not going to answer you. Um, so it was easiest for us to put it that way. Um, and then kind of where we live, her new one does have our um, on the inside of it, it's a two-sided one. It does have our, our address on the inside of it now, but um, just as an example of what you can do. And we've really tried in all these trainings to just tell the officers, like, don't pull over the cars with the autism license plates. Just kidding. No. <laughs> they are not on board with that. I'll be honest. Daryl said the same thing when she came to the sheriff's Yes. Office. Like I said, we've been trying, we've been promoting it. No, just kidding. <laughs> But it does tell an officer that possibly there's someone in that vehicle. So when they come up on your window and your kid is maybe not in a seatbelt anymore or bouncing off out of the walls or, you know, like banging on the windows again, it, 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 they're supposed to be kind of prepared for that. You know what I mean? So that is what, again, you still have to pull over. You still have to do all that. Um, please respond appropriately. But we have asked them to understand that the occupants of the cars may have autism. You know what I mean? And that could be one of the passengers, you know, most likely would be somebody's kid. Cause that's, again, that's what I'm afraid of when we have to get pulled over. It doesn't happen all the time, but it's happened enough that I know like, yeah, Maya freaks out, you know, we're in the car for a purpose. 
we're trying to go somewhere and now we're not. And she's super, super upset about it. Um, and it doesn't help to tell a cop, just give me the, just let me out of here. Just hurry and give me the ticket already, you know? Um, but it does help to let them know that this is why I have some increased anxiety. This is what's going on in my car. This is why she's crying. Um, you know, you do need to help them understand that. And then this is, again, I can, when I send, if you, if you want me to send out slides, I can, and I can add Jamie's number on here. I can add some of the links. Again, I can add the link for the, um, the big red safety box. But again, I think that it's through, it's the National Autism Association. So you could Google big red safety box, or I can, um, I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute. And we do have some time to just hang out and talk and I can find some of these resources for you. Um, and put them in the chat or I can send them out in the email whatever you think might be easiest. And again, you know, we can, you please feel free to like unmute or turn on your cameras or if you have any questions or anything like that. Hey, Colleen. Hi. Hi. So I do have a question. Oops, now I've got my cupboards open. Um, so as far as school resource officers, I'm wondering if um, you or Officer Cox can answer this question about, like, are they, I, I know, you know, school personnel is, is bound by the FERCA law, which is, um, you know, not sharing private personal information about the students, but are school resource officers bound or officers in general bound by any um, personal, like HIPAA or barring personal, you know, giving out that personal information. Cause I have, and why I ask that is <clears throat> I, I have some parents that are hesitant to um, share that personal or that medical diagnosis and that health information. Um, worried that it will just get out everywhere, you know? So I'm wondering if you could answer that question. We are um, held to privacy standards for, you know, we, we go into people's homes and we deal with people on their worst day and we're not, we're not allowed to really talk about that unless it's pertinent to something that's, you know, if the school resource officer had to call and there's medical that came as fire department paramedics, or there's another issue where other officers are arriving, then of course that information would be pertinent and we would share that information. But um, typically I believe, and I would like our school resource officer would probably be way better to answer these and I have not um, served in that capacity, but they have access to the files at school, just like any other um, teacher or administrator there. So if they had questions, they could probably find it, but um, giving that information and and it doesn't ever hurt to say I, I hope you understand this is in confidentiality I would never say never and never say always and I'd say 99.9% .9 of us as law enforcement are smart enough to not share that you probably always can have that 0.001% that does something that makes us all look bad but for the most part yeah we're, we're not allowed to share that information and that then they're actually a really good resource even you know again with or without official diagnoses you know what i mean like to go to as far as somebody to help your kids um role play with um with law enforcement they have they have they are also required to do this training we have done a ton of training with school resource officers um and Our school resource officers are very like it's a special personality that takes that role right so to be able to work with junior high and high school kids and elementary school kids and that's your whole day um, is working with kids like I don't know that I would be a great school resource officer but they really are patient and are some of the best officers that I know that would be um, great to work with that kind of role yeah. play you guys would like or want exactly yeah Roz I'd love for you to jump in well I just wanted you guys to know that um Golly, I'm trying to think when it was. It's was probably two months ago or so. Uh, Davis County School op Resource Officers, they had a big meeting right here out at Freeport. And both myself and Julie 
um, our director, Julie Larson, we were both asked to come out and speak. And so we went out and gave, at least my part was to give the parent perspective of having a child with a disability. And one of the things we did encourage is for, for the school re resource officers was to go in and visit the school they're assigned to go and check out the special ed classrooms. Now we know that's not all of our kids, but at least that way, if they could go in and, and make their presence known to the kids and maybe get to know them so they weren't so afraid of them, but it was a great opportunity and they were very responsive. And um, I really liked that opportunity that we had a chance to go and talk, but I'm sure we didn't get everybody. I don't know, Jamie, if you were at that meeting, um, or not but. our school resource officers so yeah I'm not a school resource officer but I know yeah. that the ones that we have um, the district Davis County School District organizes those usually a couple times a year they'll have a thing where all the school resource officers come from every agency in the county so that they are all getting on board that same type of training and then yeah. we as well just before even the house bill we had autism training and then um, mental health first aid so hopefully everybody's seeing some improvements and we truly the majority of us want to come and help and do a good job so um if we appreciate the opportunity to be here and to learn and to to get information from you guys as parents because nobody knows this better than you on ways that we can help um i know you guys don't know me but my name is carol drescher and i am jamie's sister but I am a special education teacher and have been for years. And I mostly have been quiet. I'm very impressed with this. I'm going to see if they have anything like this here. And if not, I'm going to see if maybe you can help somebody. I have a very good friend who has a son with autism. Um, well, and a lot of students that I've had. But one thing I want to mention is, as, according, uh, as far as the school resource officers go, that you may want to think about as parents is if you have a child who has an in Utah the, here, we call them behavior intervention plans or a BIP. Um, usually there's pretty specific reactions that are supposed to be followed in the event of um, an escalated behavior or something. Uh, I would think it would not hurt to make sure, find out from the teacher if the school resource officer knows that. Um, I have seen a situation where a school resource officer tried to step in and help and escalated a situation and the teacher was not sure she went against what that, I mean, we have great, Jamie's right, the resource officers tend to be people who are really good with students, but you know, the teacher was put in a position where she's telling a police officer back off and, um, but she did and I was proud of her for doing that. Um, because they had a behavior plan. So just if anybody has a BIP or a specific thing, make sure they're aware of it because they would be more than happy to help, but they may not always know that. I think that's great advice because again, the point is to create positive relationships. And so if, if you know what I mean, if something were to happen where that was put in jeopardy, like all that work is for nothing you know what I mean so no I think that's a fabulous yeah. idea to include your school resource officers in yeah that. and ours are great they go into the classrooms and those kids that have a little bit more visible disability right. or differences they tend to be better with but some of those kids on the spectrum who maybe it's not quite as apparent that's where sometimes um, they can be more misunderstood that's from my point of view and what I've seen and they're and they're usually and they usually tend to be less likely to self-disclose as well and that and that's and that's where um there is a fine line for that you know again that's why we're not asking anyone to diagnose conditions or to request that information from somebody um and michelle that kind of goes into your your question a little bit too is that um had your daughter possibly been, I don't know if she was, if she had already been self-diagnosed to her employer, it might've helped. Um, I was going to type a response to that, but it was a little lengthy. So I hope it's okay that we just talk about it. Yeah. Well, that's. So there's no way currently that I'm aware of for like dispatch center to dispatch center. So say you're 
daughter works in Weber County, but lives in Davis County, and you have on file your address with us. We don't um, typically flag, um, we have ways to flag individuals, but it's very specific to that dispatch center. I, so like we use one program that we can run a name and it will pop up a local file instead of something that's on like statewide or nationwide that will just give us the information that says X, Y, Z. And my hope is that the officers that are investigating that would have called and spoken to both parties prior to just coming up with a determination that there was something wrong based on one side. Um, usually we're, we try to get two sides of that. So I don't know if it was the employer that asked her to not come and maybe was unaware of specific things. Well, she was, she was placed through VR. <clears throat> I'm kind of her, with that. I'm sorry. She did that alone to me. I, I don't know. That's where I, the employer definitely needs some more training. Yeah. I mean, it was so sad. She doesn't drive. So I dropped her off at work. And a few minutes later, she calls me and says, mom come pick me up you know and I go back and I couldn't even find her because she was so distraught she was hiding outside the workplace and um you know she'd shown up and the employer even though the employer knew she was placed through VR said um you know you've had this complaint filed against you and we have to suspend you until the issue is resolved and and that that's what they did yeah. and the sheriff did eventually come out and speak with us and um you know it was resolved very quickly and no no uh charges were filed but yeah. she was so traumatized she could not go back to the workplace even when it was resolved and so she what lost maybe she lost working. her job yeah. and i was just thinking isn't there some way to to flag ahead of time our kids that are that are apt to get into these situations um, so that maybe there's a little bit of discussion first before the legal wheels start to, you know, to turn. It sounds like on this that they kind of, the workplace made their own determination and did the suspension and then called law enforcement. Um, okay. That maybe we didn't, we, we will never, um, employment's a civil nature, right? So I'm never going to go to an employer and say, you need to suspend them or that's not my job. That's not my role. I, I enforce Utah law and Utah law is all I enforce. I don't workplace stuff is all civil in nature. So that would be something, but yes, if you like, if you live in a County and you'd like that information put on her local file, most mm -hmm. agencies had something through dispatch that just gives us again, the, that information, like the card that would say, um, you know, this is my diagnosis or this is my, my emergency contact information. This is yeah. what like things not to do. Like, don't, don't try to come for her by putting your arm on her shoulder. She's not, you know, those kinds of things would be that you could add to that. File. Yeah. And it's, it's not statewide. So it would only be for the local area for the local dispatch. Okay. But okay. Yes, that's something in, and your local dispatch center should be able to help with that We're flagging those names. Local, we just create a local file is how we okay. do Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. And I just posted a link to that card if you wanted to grab that off of the chat too um, for that. But okay, I see it. Well, you know, Colleen and Jamie, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, this has I been just, great. I just wanted to add <laughs> this is Roz. You know, when Carol was talking about that behavior intervention plan. You know, our jobs as parents never ends. And even though we're now out in the community and working, communication is still so key and making sure voc rehab or whoever's coaching, job coaching and helping it transition this person into this company, communicate with them and just say, you know, she'll be very reactive to this. Mm -hmm. If you yell at her, she'll shut down. If you touch her or him, because, you know, our kids with autism, they don't like to be touched. And then they kind of get excited. So, again, communication, I think, is always going to be key, even as they're growing up and we cross our fingers to be functioning adults. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it was such a mess in this particular case. Her job coach had actually quit and not told anybody. And so I thought she was still getting 
you know, the coaching and she's over 18. And so we aren't legal guardians of that particular child. And we weren't able to go in and talk to the employer ourselves and we couldn't reach the job coach. And we found out after this happened that he had been gone for like two weeks (laughs) and hadn't told anybody. So it was just, it was like a perfect storm, I think. And you know, well-meaning people all around, but just one of those things that happens with our kids. So yeah, I just need to thank all of you for, for this and to push that legislation through. It's been a good thing. I think that we've all tried to do, but now that we have more people speaking out and resources to, to provide the training and parents willing to come talk to us and let us know what we can do to help. That's, I mean, most of us got in this job to do just that to help. So it's nice to know the ways we can. And I just have, have a comment too. Um, this is Darlene Davis. I grew up in Davis County in Bountiful and then lived in Salt Lake County until 2003 when we moved here to Price. And you can know what, what is going to go on in, in more urban Utah, but I had to learn some lessons living in rural Utah. And some of them are good. One of them is it's a smaller police department and sheriff's department and fire department but I was not aware and you need to be aware when you're traveling in rural Utah some of your first responders particularly fire and ambulance and EMT crews will not be in uniforms they're volunteers That's very and true. so if you've taught your kids really carefully that you know the people that come to help you are going to be in uniforms that's not always the case when you're not in an urban area and I got a real rude awakening when I was in a traffic accident and this guy shows up next to my van and says I want you to turn this way I need to take your blood pressure and I'm going and who are you well he was uh, one of our volunteer fire department people so if you've got kids that are really set and you're going to be traveling, you may want to be aware of that when you're going other places, especially if they're really reactive. And I think it's also a good idea to know which areas you're traveling to are familiar with crisis intervention team. Price is very familiar with crisis intervention team and Carbon County is too. But if you're going to be going on vacation or going on an activity, it's good to know if you, you know, call dispatch, what you can find out and who you can tell when you call 911. Um, Because it's not the same everywhere. Yeah. And Christine, I was gonna say the same thing that Jamie just just, um, posted is that um, many, many officers receive CIT training that doesn't mean that they have <sighs> that they have the same experience that all officers have and are as well trained as you might need. Correct. Correct. But at least gives them a heads up that you have something going on that might need special handling. Yeah, and and the and CIT is a crisis intervention team. Right. And and um and they do receive additional training, um, but it's a couple hours, and and it's and it and it is basic de-escalation, but it's not very specific to mental health. Actually, it's it's more just like verbal judo. And I and that's why I think it's important to know kind of if if it's a this is a real important point for you when you're traveling to know where you're going, because I live here. I know that our particular area has a good reputation with handling people with mental health and other issues. Um, and, and their crisis intervention team training is, is good, but you may want oh, to be guys. aware you're not going to get the same response everywhere you go. Right. Even, even with officers, right. You're going to get a different experience because we're all just different personalities and different people. And I, again, the majority, I think really are trying and working, but you're always going to get that point oh one percent that gives us all a bad name and doesn't handle a situation appropriate even if they've been through all the training in the world so right that we can you have parents that are the same way i mean it, you it know we all have our bad days in nature it's just how we are <laughs> all of us 
Yeah. Sorry. Real quick before we go, I'm not going anywhere. If you guys still have questions or want to talk, but if, if, if you can see that workshop survey and you don't mind taking that, I would really appreciate it. Um, that we do work off of grants. And so we need data to do more of these and to provide the information just so it does help us a ton. If you can, if you can do that. Um, so it's not letting me, um, put my responses in. Mine took my responses, but when I, I'm not sure if it submitted. Oh, it went back up again. Oh, because I relaunched it. So maybe it's, I'll admit, I've never had success with, with the polls. <laughs> Dean, I don't know if you have any, like, if you guys have better experience with launching polls, but I am. I have no, never... <clears throat> and I think they've had some issues with it lately. Oh, this, so this one, mine worked this time. And I, think I would for a say while, just keep like trying zoom, you know what I mean? Like there was ones uh -huh. that we weren't, yeah, but you know, and then there's the other part when the reality of a crisis happens, it's a crisis, you know? And I mean, we all sometimes think we know what we're going to do and we lose it because we're in crisis. That's where that three by five card, right? will come ahead. <laughs> yeah. You know what else though? I know that we don't, <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say, <laughs> and and I know that we all are pretty stretched thin on personal resources, but even like, even if we, if you have a neighbor, someone called the other day into the center in pretty bad crisis, but it was their neighbor. And she was like, well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm relaying information because, you know, my, my friend here is having the situation and she can't even hold the phone. She's dealing with the situation. And I was like, oh, how wonderful that you can be there and be that person. You know what I mean? And she's like, well, I don't even know what to do. I'm just here to talk on the, to make the phone call. And it's like, but I think that that's one of the things that has prevented me from making calls in the past is that I physically could not, you know, um, another one is that, yeah, I don't know what I would need in that situation besides just an extra pair of hands. And so, um, I do know that when parents call us, that they're on their last, like if I'm getting a phone call and being dispatched emergently, then that means you guys have stretched all your resources out and things are at a point that you, I know you guys don't want me there. So for me to be able to show up and try to offer help in a situation that is not my day to day or not our day to day, as far as law enforcement, I think um, having that card or again, I know we've talked about it, but just because we're stepping into a world you've lived in for whatever, and we're coming in for two minutes of the worst of the worst time, right? Yeah. So what you guys can do to just let us know what we can do to help because you guys know. And so that's where that pre-plan comes in. What I need to do to help you. That's, that's where that three by five card to even just hand it to us and be like, I can't, you know, or your neighbor hand it to us or have it in dispatch or whatever, then, then we can help because it's, it's few and far between that you guys are the pros at this. We're just here to help and hopefully mitigate some issues and and again, most of the time it will be for either, you know, even our school resource officers report that most of the time it's not for the behavior stuff that they get called on. It's for the child that eloped. It's for, um, you know, it's for wandering, you know, is, is probably the, the main reason why law enforcement gets called in on a lot of these situations. So still just, knowing, he's just not understanding that it's normal or, or a misunderstanding themselves at this time. And that that's just something you guys have coping things that you work through, but someone else is going to call us and we're going to show up not knowing. This is also a, a good time to you know, talk to other parents too. I have never had to have law enforcement come to my house, but there is another parent who has had a lot of experience with children in foster care and has a foster child that's an adopted child now that I wasn't even aware of some of the things that were available in my own county, but in through conversations with her and her experience and having the sheriff <laughs> come out and send people to deescalate. And, and sometimes they've actually removed her son for a period of time for him to, the, to, de to deescalate before he's returned home what was available in, you know, my own area. And so sharing with other parents and what's worked for them and what, what they're 
you know, areas of strength are helps a lot when you get into a, a crisis because you're thinking ahead, well, who knows how to deal with this that I could get a hold of. Um, What's neat and, about the family to family network is like, you know, yes. is, is, is your local connections and finding out what has worked for other families in your area, what is available for your kids. Because again, what will work for you guys isn't the same that, that, that isn't the same facilities I went to in Salt Lake, you know, especially in the south end of the valley. So, but the approach that you've talked about tonight is one that I can share with other people if we could get them to come to step. That's that's the hard part. And I have a lot of family in Davis County and, 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 and in fact, a niece that's autistic. So I'll be sharing some information with her mom. But, you know, um, crisis is a hard, hard time. And sometimes after the crisis is over, having someone to, to talk to and help you dissect is a good thing too. Yeah. Um, and that, that's another one. I feel like I, I get really, I get really sad when I, when there's, when, even when I can't find resources for families, it's heartbreaking. You know what I mean? Like they just really are few and far between, even for, for those of us that, that's all I'm doing day in and day out is looking for those resources and, and talking to other professionals about, you know, resources and things like that. Um, and so sometimes I do feel like, yeah, if, if all I can do is just maybe help myself. And so that's why I'm actually going through all of this Davis County stuff, learning about what's available more outside of the county. I loved this part of the, the Davis behavioral health site. It has, um, and, and we actually do a workshop on resiliency and stuff like that, but there, this one that they have on this website, I just posted, it's um, being and becoming resilient. And there's one on um, three keys to a happy life. And it's, there's eight ways to improve mental health. They're actually really good. You know what I mean? Like, again, not that we have all this extra time in the world, but um, if we're trying to be proactive about mental health things and about staying out of crisis, it's, it's, it is maintaining those things. It is staying out of the crisis. And, and I thought they were super helpful, you know, so I had to go back and watch some of those and they were pretty good. I was impressed, but. It, was there anything else that anyone like maybe expected to get out of this or was there something that they needed answered out of it that they didn't find out or any other questions or anything? There's been some great resources shared and if you can send an email out to all of us with all of that information like the red box that was new uh -huh. because I always thought I'll just have something in my um, glove box, but I haven't updated it. You know, it's there, but it's, you know, not the current phone number because my phone numbers changed. So this has just a, been a helpful reminder and just, yeah, lots of good stuff. Thank you. You're so welcome. Anytime, anytime. I really appreciate being asked to do it. I appreciate Jamie's time. I'm glad you guys all came. Thank you all very, very much. Are you going to make this recording available?